interoperability is a, uh, is a vital thing. So uh, crime is transnational. Um, it, it occurs all, all over the world and may be detected all over the world. Uh, people travel. Um, and so the enrollment sample and the, the second encounter sample may be dislocated in time and in geography. And so connecting those two samples together requires transmission and it requires a, a, a standardized exchange from organization A to organization B. Um, that process requires interoperability and that requires a standard and, and conformance to the standard. Interpol is, uh, is perhaps unique uh, in that it's uh, a, a central point that's a, a originally set up to exchange law enforcement data um, uh, between countries and, and to do that you need a standard. So Interpol is you know, arguably one of the most important users of, of, of the standard um, and uh, they have a, a keen interest in a successful exchange of, of law enforcement data. And so the use and the requirement to use the standard um, is uh, uh, a necessary part of Interpol's activity, but is also influential on the people who collect biometric data in the first place. And, uh, and so the influence is, is, is uh, pervasive across the world that any law enforcement agency who wants to deal with Interpol is, uh, is going to use the standard. Um, of course, the standard requires not just the bits and the bytes to be in the right order uh, for conformance to the standard, but also that the images that are encoded in the standard actually look good and are collected in conformance with the requirements of the standard. So that's compression requirements, appearance requirements, um, rotation requirements, capture requirements. All of this uh, leads to successful outcomes. Traditionally, uh, fingerprints are, uh, uh, are searched uh, maybe by a, a, an APHIS machine, and the, uh, the output of that is adjudicated by trained forensic examiners. We conducted a study uh, sponsored by uh, the US government um, to see whether latents could be processed uh, uh, fully automatically, so without preparation uh, at the front end before searching, and then uh, with a fixed threshold after the search such that an examiner wouldn't be needed. And of course the, the, the result of that is that in some cases you can do an automated search uh, just as you can with live scan fingerprints. But when quality is bad the, uh, the result is that you really do need an examiner and you know the human, uh, the human expertise is, is a necessary component. Uh, for the difficult cases and unfortunately many of the forensic cases are those difficult cases. So uh, the overall result is that the recognition algorithms, the automated recognition algorithms, um, can reduce workload on an examiner. They can uh, shorten candidate lists and present fewer candidates to an examiner. We see the emergence of biometrics um, coming from the uh, law enforcement arena increasingly into the civil arena. So for example, the governments of India and Malaysia, uh, and of course in the United States, are increasingly using biometrics for um, uh, uniquely identifying uh, per persons. And so India has plans to enroll 1.2 billion people um, and to deduplicate those people by, you know, so that they can be assigned uh, a unique identity. Uh, that requires uh, quite a lot of biometric power and the approach is to use 10 fingerprints, standardized, and two iris images, also standardized, uh, to be sent to a receiving system for deduplication. Um, so that application, uh, uh, those civil applications, promise um, increased uptake of biometric equipment and a, an increasingly vibrant marketplace of biometric equipment. That in turn affords good equipment because the industry is, is well capitalized.